Hello, I'm Julie Swenson, Managing Director of Forward Theater Company in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm Jen Alpoff Gray, Founder and Artistic Director of Forward Theater Company, and this is Theater Forward, a twice monthly conversation about theater from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we're excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theater in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 84 of Theater Forward. 84, fantastic. (laughs) Uh, And Julie, I am going to let you introduce our incredible guest today. Oh, I am so thrilled to have uh, my friend and colleague, Linda Stevens, joining us. Um, Linda has been acting on stages for 50 years. She's been awarded for her work in New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Miami, and D.C., She's appeared on Broadway and off-Broadway in dozens of regional theaters across the country. She's worked with and been praised by Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller, and Stephen Sondheim. She's been blessed with a rich life in the theater, and we've been blessed to have her in our lives. And after living in cities across the country, Linda now calls Milwaukee home. Welcome, my friend. It's so great to have you here. It's great to be here. Welcome, Linda. And one of the, I mean, we would be delighted to talk to you at any time, but we are particularly excited to chat with you now because you have just published your memoir, There Is No Backstage. What a great title. Mm -hmm. And um, so I want to, you know, we'll at least start this conversation off talking about this this beautiful, beautiful book. And um, maybe you could start with, when did you start writing it? How, How long did you spend working on this book? <clears throat> well, you know, I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out when it began. And um, I don't really know. I went back in my records because I've kept pieces that I've written for myself mostly. They're all pretty journalistic, you know, over the years. And I saw that I did write one in 1994 when I was on Broadway when my father passed away. I got that job at the same time my father passed away and I wrote about it then. So that was 1994. So I wrote that story, which is in the book. But I think I truly began writing the book with the cabarets that I've done in Milwaukee. I moved here when I was 59 and the next year, which was 2006, I did my first cabaret, started telling my stories And every cabaret I did since then, which was three more, um, was a group of stories about my life. And then when the pandemic hit, (laughs) I started stringing those stories together. And then it took on its own life and and found its own shape. So that's that's it, I think. Well, Linda, I know that um, oftentimes um, when people write memoirs, uh, it, it is certainly to tell their story, um, but that you had other angles for your memoir and how and how you want it to affect people. And why did you write it is actually what I'm what I'm offering up to you. Okie dokie. Well, I, I don't think I knew why I was writing it until I was in the middle of writing it. And I thought, OK, this is for young actors. For one thing, this is not this is not a memoir about my life in the theater, quote unquote. This is a memoir about my life as an actor. And I wanted young actors to be able to look at what an actor's life is actually like. Plus, I think I've always wanted civilians, you know, we call (laughs) our audience members civilians to, to also know that there are many successful actors in the world, and I'm one of them, who's actually made a living being an actor that you've never heard of. Mm -hmm. And this is what the life looks like. So that's why I wrote it. I also realized near the end that I wrote it for myself because it's a hard life and any actor will tell you that. And I wondered why I stayed in it so long. And I sort of made many discoveries along the way. So there you go. That's well, what, what, uh, beautiful. And I, I just uh, all the things that you're describing were exactly my experience reading this beautiful, beautiful book. Oh, and um, you, you mentioned that you made discoveries along the way. And that that was kind of my next question is, is, you know, what 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 did you learn about yourself or about our field through the process of writing, writing down your life story? 
Well, you know, you might hear a lot of actors say, I never left because I didn't know what else to do. And I think that's true for a lot of us. But I think um, one of the reasons I kept going um, is that I was always castable. I never typed out, if you know what that means, that, well, you would know what that means, but for mm -hmm. People who are not in showbiz, it means I never grew beyond my age type. I have a wonderful friend in New York who's who's been working at Carnegie Hall as the head of the patron program for years. And he typed out when he was in his mid 30s because he looks like a boy. Um, so he wasn't being cast anymore. I was always being cast. So I, I moved from ingenue into leading lady, into older actress, into older, older actress. I'm still castable, um, which is astonishing, but um, I don't necessarily want to do it anymore. Um, <laughs> and for many reasons, but, you know, we don't need to go into that. Um, I, what about the business? Have I found out? It's just hard. Um, it's a hard business, but you have to know who you are and you have to know that it's up to you ultimately to find your work. Even if you have good friends who are, you know, producers and directors, they can't make the work for you. You have to keep going. You have to know yourself in this business. You have to know yourself in every business. But you become, you either have to leave it because it's too rough on who you are, or I think you become stronger as a human being doing this work, particularly theater, I think. I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think? <laughs> I think, I think that's I, exactly right. Right. And I've seen it in, in, you know, in the artists that I work with who are not in the ingenue phase of their careers, whether they're designers or directors or actors, you know, we all have that sort of ingenue phase of our, of our careers and the people we work with who are in, in their, their middle or older age phase of their career, they are some of the strongest humans that I know. And I certainly count you among them, Linda. And, and so I think that's really beautifully described. Yeah. And I and I love um, the idea of this book that um, you traveled a lot, Linda. You went you no. went from the gig to the gig to the gig, which were yeah. in different cities in different states, and um, and that's part of it too. I and I, um, you know, back to what you were saying about bringing this to um, those performance majors, uh, you know, in in colleges across the country. How important it is that you don't. You don't get the thing and then move to New York and then you're on Broadway and done. And now my career is done. Um, as we know, that's not how it works. Yes. Um, uh, and I love I love that you are chronicling how it works. And um, I would say, speaking of um, colleges, you and I share an alma mater. You do. At Illinois Wesleyan University in the cornfields of Bloomington Normal. Yes. Um, and uh, uh, that's where you met Larry Shue. That is where I met Larry. And um, you, if you're comfortable, would love to hear uh, that story. Well, look, I'm just going to read uh, the first part of the book because that tells everything. All right. Um, and, um, you know, another reason I wrote the book is that I wanted to ask myself, how it is that I end up being an actor instead of a musician or a singer, because that's what I'm trained in. I have a, a music degree from Illinois Wesleyan um, in voice uh, with a minor in violin. And um, the first time Illinois Wesleyan put together a, a musical, um, they used both the music school and the drama school. And so here's the story. Um, my mother told me that when I was four years old, I walked into a room of adults sitting around after dinner, sang Silent Night from beginning to end and silenced the room. It seems that I declared myself a singer very early on. But the actress in me wasn't born until the spring of 1968. 
in a first time collaboration between the music and drama schools at Illinois Wesleyan University in a production of My Fair Lady. From the music school, I was cast as Eliza Doolittle. And from the drama school, Larry Shu was cast as Henry Higgins. Larry Shu, beloved Larry Shu, brilliant Larry Shu who would become known as the playwright of the nerd, the foreigner, Grandma Duck is Dead, and Wenceslas Square. Larry Shu, who at the age of 39 would pass away when the small plane he was traveling on from Richmond to Stanton, Virginia, flew into the side of a mountain overlooking the Shenandoah Valley. It was 1985. But in 1968, during the run of My Fair Lady, every night, I was challenged to rise to Larry's dazzling performance and every night before the bows, he would take me in his arms in the dark backstage and give me a whopper of a kiss. My opening night present from him was not a bunch of roses, but a live guinea pig that he named Eliza. <laughs> so that's how <laughs> my actress began. And it was because of Larry. And here's the thing I discovered writing this book. Actually, when it was finished, I discovered this. I didn't know how much Larry would be peppered throughout the book. And he is. Larry and my mother are peppered throughout this book, which was a discovery for me. But he was an actor. Larry was an extraordinary actor and loved life. So he, he said, I, we were Thalia and Mel Plumini, I forget which is which, comedy and tragedy. He was the comedy. I was the tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten a little better in that direction over the years, but he helped. And you've worked on so many projects with or by him throughout your career. I mean, you, you just did Foreigner, right? At Milwaukee Rep not that many years ago. Yeah, yeah, that was, that's what I, I like to call my final play. Hi, kitty. I see your kitty. Yeah, <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> uh, yeah um, and I had never done it before. And I'm ashamed to say I'd never read it before. Because Is that right? That's right. Um, because I was remarried. Larry and I divorced when we were in our um, early 30s. And I remarried. And so I had a whole different uh, life in the theater with a director husband who was a terrific artist. So I was in a different direction in a different town. And I did not go through Larry's career with him in the early days. So I read The Foreigner and I thought, oh, my God, I think I know who this old woman is. Uh, I think it's his mother. Mm. And, uh, some people would say no. Some people would say no. She's too country a woman. And she is a country woman. But her heart and her sense of humor were Larry's mother. And she was beloved to me. So I got to play Larry's book. <laughs> At least that's the way it felt. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Linda, I, I've had the privilege of knowing you personally for, I mean, 15 plus years now, you know, we, um, you were in a new play festival that I produced for the Madison repertory theater. You've, yeah. you've done some readings of plays here for forward, but you know, you know, this already, I, I, I saw you in damn Yankees on Broadway. I, I was still I living in New York. Then I saw that production and absolutely was transfixed by your performance. I mean, there's, there are, there are perhaps flashier roles in in that play in that musical than the one that you played but the heart and just reality you brought to it struck me then and so then to a few years you know a few years down the road move here and discover that you'd made Wisconsin your your home was was such a a delicious and delightful surprise and our yeah. ongoing conversations since then have been just such a privilege but you know, I, one thing I wanted maybe to have you talk a little more about, because I think this is something that's so important to me. You've said that your life in the theater feels more like a calling than a career. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to explain a little more what you mean by that. Well, um, 
Jim Higgins actually wrote that in his review. He wrote a review in, in uh, the Journal Sentinel of my book, which was a wonderful thing for him to have done. But he said the career, it looks more like a calling than a career. The business I had in, in I call it the biz of show. Um, I think it is a calling because I never decided to be an actor. I married Larry Shu, followed his lead and became an actor. And then when we were divorced, I was married to a director and I followed his lead. But all along the way, working, I never stopped working. And not only because I didn't type out, but because the work was always there, which is kind of amazing to me um, that it was always there. And I think it it might still be if if I wanted to do it, I'm just, you know, I'm I'm just spoiled these days, uh, like many older actors who've been privileged enough to, to do as much work as I've done over the years with as many different people. Um, there are just not a lot of roles that I want to sort of plug my psyche into. Um, at this point, I want a role that will teach me something. You know, but people always say, um, well, then you write it. Um, yeah, okay. But that's not what we do. But I think we also are, we being the collective, are also more interested in our younger stories, certainly in our coming of age stories, than we are uh, our older stories. Maybe because it's good to go back and see how we got here, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is why I wrote the book. How yeah. did I get here? You know, I don't know. I don't know how to answer that question clearly, but I've always. There's always been a level of spirit involved in the work for me all along the way. Maybe it's because I started in church as an eight year old singing solos. You know, I'm still on a level, a church singer. Mm. That's what I believe. And I love what you said about wanting only to take on roles that would teach you something. Are there roles in your career that, you would reflect back and go, oh, those, those are a couple of my favorites. Those really taught me something. Is there something that comes to mind? Well, yeah, my sort of claim to fame that not a lot of people actually saw, but it, in Chicago, it just won me a slew of rewards and then platforms me to New York, to the public theater, which is the role that got me auditions so that I got into Dan Yankees, but it's Emily Stilson in Wings. Um, Wings is an Arthur Copet play that um, my forever friend, Jeff London and his partner, Arthur Perlman, uh, turned into a musical. It's not exactly a musical, it's somewhere between a musical and a kind of an opera. Um, and it shouldn't have worked. But it did. She's a stroke victim. She's in her early 80s. And the play sort of takes the audience and the actors immediately into her stroke. So we go through a world where nothing makes sense. And we view it from the inside out. We, we view it from her point of view. What she taught me and continues to remind me is to remember that life is an adventure. And no matter what's going on, keep looking forward and finding out what's what's there, what's going on next. How can you move through this? So she's she's my she's my anchor role. But you know, uh, Lizzie in one ten in the shade is is my uh, young leading lady role. And I still I'm such a romantic that I believe in that role so much. Um, and, and I have to say that um, the foreigner, the, the, the wonderful character in, in Foreigner, just reminded me, like Larry did doing that play, that 
you have to remember to laugh. <laughs> you just have to remember that life is full of joy. I've had so many roles to play. I'm, I'm sure other actors have said, I can't tell you my favorite role. And I can't really. Of course. But I've had, I've had, I've had a lot. Mm. They all teach you something when you do them. Okay. What I miss, though, as an actor is playing with other actors. Because I'm basically a company actor without a company. <laughs> <laughs> we love to play together. We all do. Julie, you know that. I do. Yes. We yeah. love to play together. So if I miss anything about the theater, most of all, it's playing with actors and making the production with everybody involved. Mm -hmm. Team theater. sport. Yep. Team sport the theater. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So like that. Linda, were there any parts of the of the book that you found particularly um, difficult to write? Yeah, I've made some major mistakes in my life. Some I've done some I made some moves that were absolutely wrong to do. One was moving away from New York to Atlanta. I did it because my mother was living there alone and also because that was home for me. That was my only adult home. But it was too early for me to move away. And I found that out. And I found out the hard way that you can't go back. So what did I do? I went back again. I went back <laughs> to New York. And that, that was a real mistake. I, I was like in my mid 50s then. So um, I knocked myself down the casting ladder, which you know what that is. Um, and um, finding work from then, I did find work. I had a lot of interesting work, but it was harder and life was harder. Um, so it was hard to go back into that and remember what it was like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, kind of difficult, but but not not really part for me to write was the the early years, the years I call survivors, which is really the early part of my life. And I felt I had to do that because I really don't know why my parents moved so much. And I sort of found that out writing that session. And I would not have known about that had I not sat my mother down at one point and said, you told me we moved to like six or seven places before I was four years old. What were those places and what was it like? And so I wrote that down and then I moved forward in life from there. And I didn't have much good memory, but memory started coming back. So that was interesting. And I learned a lot about myself, that traveling is in my bones. I knew that. But writing about it, I realized, oh, my God, you had no other choice. This is part of the way you learned in life. So I just sort of slid into being a, a traveling actor because... That's what I knew. Well, you traveled, traveled what? to Milwaukee. You traveled yeah. to Milwaukee then. What brought you? Yes. What brought you to our fine state? What were the, what were yeah. you know the machinations involved in that? I was in John Dillon is two artistic directors of the rep back. There was John Dillon and then Joe Hanready and now Mark Clements and Larry and I had been in the very first production that John Dillon directed in Washington, D.C. Um, in like the, the mid 70s. And then when John Dillon was made artistic director at the Rep, uh, he invited both of us up at that time. I was divorcing Larry, but Larry came. And thanks to John Dillon, Larry wrote all those plays. I stayed in Atlanta. But the year that Larry died, John Dillon brought me north to Milwaukee. And that began many years of my being an out-of-town actor at the Milwaukee Rep. Mm -hmm. So I already knew Milwaukee. I certainly knew the Rep. And when it was time for me to leave New York and I didn't know where to go because I knew I couldn't go back anywhere, <laughs> I'd learned that lesson now. I just came and sat by the lake and 
saw a sunset that blew me away and decided, you know what, I'm moving to Milwaukee. It was a life move. And it's been a very good life move. Uh, and, and our that, game. And our game yeah, that you are well, here. <laughs> well, mine too. I mean, so many friends here, which I really, really wanted and needed. So thank you. <laughs> We're, we really feel like the lucky ones. Believe, Indeed. believe me. Um, and you know, I'll I'll start to wind us up here, but I I, I just want to say for for the folks who are listening that um, and this loops back to something you said earlier, Linda. It's it this is this is a gift for young actors who might be looking for um, an example of how how a long career played out for for another actor. But there is something so valuable for people who just love theater and are, as you say, civilians to to learn what this life is like. And obviously it's different for everyone, but but it's you've done such a beautiful job of telling your own story in a way that invites the reader in and lets us sort of feel that feel those emotional highs and lows and the satisfactions and the disappointments and um, I just I urge people to get a copy of this book and and it, it, learn something, learn right. something about I, our field. I, I so appreciate your saying that, because what we do, what we all do from the stage, I think, is basically hold the mirror up to nature. And no mm -hmm. matter who you are, no matter what you've done, um, we hope that you will see yourselves in us. And I, I hope that. People who are not in showbiz will go, oh, yeah, I know what that is. Reading mm -hmm. my. Mm -hmm. they well, will I, themselves. Yeah, I, I think that's just what you've done, Linda. So Agreed. thank you. And thank you for joining us for this conversation. Thank you for wanting me to be here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and I will say that that is all for this episode of Theater Forward, a conversation about theater in Wisconsin, the Midwest and America. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm Jen Opoff Gray. And I'm Julie Swenson. And our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden. You can follow us or share your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter. As always, um, with an ER in theater forward. Um, if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to leave a comment. We'd love to hear from you. We're so grateful to have you listening and we will be back soon for another Theater Forward conversation.